you very much. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, come and talk to you today, um, uh, Sarah, Bill and John and others. Um, obviously a very significant day for the Value in Nature programme and, and a poignant day for all of us, uh, reflecting back on the last year. Um, I'm Tom Wilde, uh, I'm a research fellow based in the Department of Landscape Architecture in the University of Sheffield. And uh, yeah, I'm the PI on the Horizon Connexus project. It's a research and innovation action. Um, five million euros uh, just kicked off in September last year and will last for another four years um, and a significant large consortium. Um, there's some big names in the in the crowd today, so uh, I hope I'm not teaching any grandmothers to suck eggs and hopefully there's something uh, for everybody. Uh, I'll not go into my background uh, too much other than to say that really uh, I've had quite an interesting uh, set of experiences and with a research focus in valuation and, and, and nature and green infrastructure. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, I think the thing that the topic that interests me most at the moment is the roles of the public and private sectors and how they do or don't invest in green or grey um, nature based solutions type interventions. Um, I'll be touching on previous experiences um, through which over the last uh, too many years <laughs> uh, I, I've been developing international projects. Um, interestingly, uh, my first European project, UrbanNet, the ERANET for Urban Sustainability, was developed together with Graham Leakes in, uh, in CEH at the time. Um, worked on a range of different projects, had a, a lot of good experiences working primarily with European partners, but more recently also significant Latin American links. Um, and yeah, also interesting to reflect back on a, a few early things. I, I started my professional career as a research assistant at the River Lab in Dorset and also the Bush Lab in Edinburgh. And um, that reminded me that uh, one of the first kind of proposals I ever did was to, what was the ODA back then, the Overseas Development Administration, to work on urban uh, water challenges in, and I think probably in my proposal at the time, I, I referred to developing countries. And so it's um, an interesting moment to, to think today with a global south perspective about what's happening in terms of GCRF and ODA and, and other things. So I'll just talk a little bit about Connexus because I think it's quite important in, 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 the, in the setting today. Um, so Connexus has the, We've got a motto that urban nature connects us. Um, and it's interesting timing because this week I've just discovered a badger living at the bottom of, of my garden. We have a set and uh, is burrowing underneath my shed. So um, it's an interesting moment for many reasons. But uh, the Connexus project is, is focused obviously uh, on, on this thing that's become really critically important, important in the light of COVID. Um, we're working across seven uh, European and Latin American cities, Sao Paulo, Bogota, Santiago de Chile, Buenos Aires, Lisbon, Barcelona and Torino. And the aim is, is, is pretty bold, it's pretty ambitious, and that reflects the core for proposals uh, that, that was around strengthening in international cooperation. So we seek to co-produce, structure and promote access to the shared contextualised knowledge needed to support cities and communities to co-create nature-based solutions and restoring urban ecosystems to uh, drive the required step change in urban policy and practice in European and Latin American countries. And we're kind of doing that uh, by reinterpreting themes of nature-based solutions at a range of spatial scales, um, macro scale in terms of green infrastructure networks, the links between uh, different cities and rural communities uh, opportunities for restoring urban and peri-urban ecosystems uh, at a range of different scales. And we're doing that through uh, a, a transdisciplinary approach uh, using life labs or living lab uh, techniques uh, for urban ecosystem restoration pilots in those seven cities. Now, if you're going to co-produce nature-based solutions with Latin America and European countries, you need the right kind of partners and, and in this case uh, quite a lot quite a lot of partners as you can see over 30 
uh, spanning research and academia, government and public sector, uh, local, regional and national scales, uh, NGOs, SMEs and international organisations. And it's a, it's a fantastic team and uh, we, well, I, I built this up bottom up really. Um, through some existing links, but also with uh, the help of some, some colleagues and a lot of support from my institution, particularly the faculty, social sciences in the University of Sheffield. So as you can see, uh, a wide span, very colorful partnership. And that kind of also is reflected in our logo uh, developed by Opla and, and others. Um, so I, I just wanted to come on to this theme of building international partnerships just quickly. And I think central to it really is, it, uh, is the jargon around transnationality and innovation, which is the building block. Those two things are the building blocks of many programs and projects. Um, and my preferred kind of thinking on innovation, uh, which features very strongly alongside international research in many cases is, is both radical and incremental changes in products, processes, and services. And that can apply in the public sector, private sector, third sector. Um, and in terms of transnationality, we can think of that in, in, in simpler ways, where there's global environmental, or global societal challenges like infrastructure, such as trans European networks, uh, climate change, biodiversity and pollution, but also in terms of political goals and things like changes in, in policy, a, a range of different scales, which require global cooperation. And I think most of us would ag agree, need to be lo locally grounded and, and touch on people's lives. And my test for a number of years on this has been, to quote Patrick Geddes, um, to, to, sorry, to, yeah, to, to, to quote Geddes, uh, folk, work and place. In other words, is it going to really make a difference to people's people's lives? Um, so uh, for Conexus um, and for my consortium, it was a, really a case of working very closely with people to understand how they felt passionately. They all feel passionately about regreening and bringing nature back into cities. Um, but what that meant for them in their local contexts, and these are green walls uh, from Bogota, Sao Paulo and Sheffield. And um, they're all very different in terms of local contexts and how people come together. So we needed a working model that would fit with that and that involves in, in the project, working at the interface of research policy and practice on a range of shared thematic interests, all of which include biodiversity and environmental justice. Now, um, this kind of is heartbreaking at this moment to see all of these friends and colleagues and classes friends now uh, when we've been unable to travel for over a year and um, we find ourselves in Zoom meetings instead. Um, but that in itself, the social aspect is extremely important, but it's not a good enough reason for international projects. Um, and probably the biggest test of all is whether, the, whether it's a, quite a case of need versus want. Um, and again, there's some useful tests for that. Is it, is it a problem that UK researchers or others can't fix alone? Uh, and a, a good indicator of that is, are you already in contact with equivalent um, uh, with peers in other countries? And are there good practices or innovations that are being applied elsewhere that we can't yet deliver or, or vice versa? You know? And if, if that's the case, then why? And, and I think that fundamental kind of probing into, into the, um, uh, the, the kind of logic chains or in, intervention logic, however you want to, theories of change, however you want to pose it, um, helps you to establish, does your idea address the funding program scope, um, the, the objectives and priorities of the funds? And also to, to ask that sort of really critical question is, should I, uh, should I better forget this and focus on something else? Because Opportunity cost is obviously critically important. And, um, you know, for every scheme that you're applying for, you're not submitting to a different core. Um, moving on to partners, and I think it's probably the biggest issue. Um, and at the end, I've, I've suggested a Mentimeter question that um, to James and John that we might put up. But uh, it's not surprising at all that um, for most people, previous collaborations uh, reflect the, the, the biggest. Um, 
source of partnerships as well as other consortium members. And I think the, the critical thing is in terms of meetings, it's now extremely difficult to meet new people um, because we're not able to go to conferences and seminars. So instead of that, I think it's really a case of relying very heavily on social networks and friends and friends. And I, I suspect now that this, this map will have changed significantly since 2006 and probably had done even before COVID. Um, so where you find your partners, uh, range of different issues. There are opportunities online um, that are always worth looking at. Things like project idea forms and call for, calls for partners. If you register, for instance, for, uh, for Cordis, you can find calls for proposals and people actively seeking networks. Um, I've talked already about existing networks. Uh, Sarah's touched helpfully on national contact points. And I think the critical thing is um, you may well, if you're lucky, uh, be find yourself delivering a project uh, fairly soon. And that's where it's it, the vitally important that, that there's that trust and reliability and, uh, in terms of people's ability to deliver what they say they can. Um, I think there are ways of testing that out and establishing the best of all is face to face and uh, spending time with people, including outside the work context, you know, um, going for a drink, having a coffee and so on. Um, but also obviously asking those kind of questions about people's motivations and values. So at the moment, obviously we're not able to do that kind of broadening of horizons or have those nice surprises or uh, side visits, which are so fundamentally important in these kind of things. Um, but uh, they will come again, and, and in the meantime, I think the, the motivation and the, that future focus is so critically important. And certainly through Connexus, I, I gave my biggest talk ever uh, in Buenos Aires to, I think it was getting on to nearly uh, 800 people. And, um, you know, that's been a real opportunity. And, and I think um, I would strongly ad ad encourage people, not advise, I'd strongly encourage people to get involved in international working wherever they possibly can. Thinking about building momentum, and particularly thinking about timing, um, how do we, if, if we're establishing a partnership, how do we get that sense of direction and, and, and positivity in the partnership? Well, I think a, 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 a fundamental starting point for that is a kind of local legitimacy, not necessarily political, not necessarily driven by UK political priorities, but could be in your institution, as I said before, um, it could be in terms of the, you know, co-productive approaches, working with local citizens and your research track record or, or your kind of project um, activity. And that is fundamentally important in establishing transnational credibility as well, um, as well as, of course, those kind of peer networks and uh, the people you publish with, the journals you, you focus on. I mentioned management support. If you've not got management support, it's just such a big, a big hurdle to get through. And, um, you know, the peer review opportunities, pre-proposal, you know, everyone should always make the most of those. Um, key interest groups, in, in my case, it might be nature, urban nature interests. Um, they can be fundamentally important when you're looking for letters of support, uh, as can national coordination or a UK policy perspective. Um, working together with secretariats and steering committees of international organisations and networks is, is really helpful as well to, to get that sense of, of purpose, but also commitment and, you know, a sense of success or prospects of success. Um, and, and also all of the above working towards um, developing that shared meaningful commitment to the global goals, things like sustainable development goals urban agenda goals and so on. I think a bit one of the biggest questions of all, and um, I think timely at least a bunny in the background here is to whether to lead or to follow, um, with apologies to Disney. Um, lead partners need the capacity to deliver a range of different skills and competencies. Um, and that's not just about academic expertise, but also judgment and um, systems behind you, administrative, financial, and so on. And, and I think a real test of that is if you have to pay a consultant to write a proposal, that is an indicator that, that you might not have those kind of capacities yet. Um, 
if you can write the proposal and gain the support and de develop the workshops and the, uh, the workshops and the kind of partnership building opportunities, that gives a sign that you're in the right place. Um, the benefits of leading a massive, the ability to steer the, uh, the science, the research, to gain the profile and the budget is huge. And the downsides are also significant. There's a lot of distraction. The administrative hassle, you know, is, is famous. Um, personally, I wouldn't let that put you off because I think the benefits far outweigh that side of things. And you gain a lot in terms of um, a range of skills that are applicable across, well, life, not just, uh, not just academia and research. Um, internal profile and uh, comes with the balance of politics as, as well, of course. Um, but I think, you know, the, these kind of international networks, it's very well established that, um, that academic careers and uh, citations and impact of publications are very strongly linked with international approaches. So the responsibility is worth it if you can, if you can follow through and bearing in mind that we all feel like dopey at the back, not really knowing what a pick is for from time to time. And, and if you don't put yourself out of that comfort zone, then, um, then you know, it, it's hard to develop. So I, I would strongly encourage that, that sort of personal journey, if you can. Not least because it gives you other opportunities. So off the back of Connexus, I recently um, completed some work for the European Commission as an expert, leading a, an expert group on nature-based solutions, state-of-the-art review. Uh, which is available from the EU Publications Office. And that fundamental research and, and networking and um, understanding has enabled me to contribute significant evidence to a recent uh, Environment Audit Committee piece of work on water quality in rivers. And um, I'm sure Mark Everard will be looking at that very closely. Um, so uh, stepping back for a moment, one of, the, one of the reasons I had the question mark was, what are the broader perspectives? What are the, the strategic lessons we can, we can learn from this? And from the urban rivers perspective and my research uh, in this area, I, I, I published some work a while back, learning from um, John Forrester's work with Deliberative Practitioner um, and abstracted seven key kind of thoughts or reflections or lessons, which are around taking time, um, avoiding presumption, expecting confusion, including internal conflicts, as well as external. Critically being careful to give people credit. There is nothing worse than someone else's logo appearing your, on your hard work uh, without your recognition. And I think we've all faced that through our careers. Providing time to think and avoiding rushing uh, to decisions on conceptual frameworks or whatever. Adopting structured approaches, like a sketching is a good way of thinking about that. And finally, building confidence through some degree of formal, formality and evaluation. Um, so for me, yeah, I think those seven lessons probably apply to most sets of partnerships. Um, maybe they become clearer into focus in international perspectives in areas maybe where you don't have the uh, cultural context quite right or the language skills. Um, but I, I think in, in a broad sense that they're, they're hopefully relevant for a range of partnership opportunities. I think that's probably where I should end and uh, thank you for listening. I, I hope that's been interesting in some way and um, look forward to the rest of the talks and thanks again uh, to Value and Nature for an excellent programme as well as event, much appreciated. <laughs>